So um, I'm going to tell you about some new work that we've been uh, focused on in our lab. Uh, some of it builds on some work we published last year, but we've hopefully taken it a step further. And it uh, revolves around the concept of hormonal crosstalk between different parallel hormonal pathways in breast cancer. Now, of course, we're interested in breast and prostate cancer uh, because it's an uh, endocrine disease. It's a disease that's um, initiated and driven by hormones. Of course, in breast, that is primarily estrogen, and in prostate cancer, it's pro primarily androgen. But of course, as Mother Nature does not things make, make things so straightforward. We know it's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. Now, we know that estrogen receptor is the driving transcription factor in about three quarters of all breast cancers. And these are the numbers from the UK. So there are about 50,000 new breast cancers every year. And a full three quarters of them are estrogen receptor positive and driven by this transcription factor. And of course, as you know, we have some very good agents uh, that target the estrogen receptor pathway. And they come in different flavors and they work through different routes, but the goal is essentially the same. And that is to stop the estrogen uh, receptor from doing its job and from, from regulating gene expression events. Now, trying to identify which women will respond to the treatments that we have and which women don't respond is a big business. There is a lot of assays out there. Um, they all work reasonably well, um, but we've, we've actually had a immunohistochemical uh, biomarker, the progesterone receptor that's been used for many, many years, and it works almost as well as some of the more expensive uh, assays that are being advertised at the moment. And what we know, and this is a, a generalization, of course, but we know that women that have a, a breast cancer that is both estrogen receptor positive and progesterone receptor positive will, will have a better outcome than women that, have a, that um, have, has a tumor that expresses estrogen receptor, but not the progesterone receptor. And the logic behind this um, is summed up here in this, in this schematic here. So we know that estrogen receptor is a transcription factor. So when it gets stimulated by its, uh, by its ligand, which is estrogen, it gets recruited onto the DNA. It will bring these cofactors, which are associated proteins that help estrogen receptor regulate gene expression and then it will switch on a number of genes. And we know that one of the genes that estrogen receptor will switch on is the progesterone receptor. So the logic goes that if a tumor expresses both estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, then that tumor is driven by estrogen receptor. So ER is doing its job, and ergo, that, that woman is likely to respond to drugs that specifically block the estrogen receptor pathway. So the key questions in my lab really are, revolve around the, the, the where and the how. So where in the, in the genome does estrogen receptor make contact? And, and from our point of view, these are the molecular switches that estrogen receptor uses to, to switch on and switch off genes. And we've been very interested in this question for a number of years. We're also interested in the how. Um, now, if you look at the old textbooks, estrogen receptor will get recruited following estrogen stimulation, and it can sit on promoters of target genes and regulate uh, gene expression. We know it's not that straightforward, and we know that estrogen receptor needs and requires a number of associated proteins, and we've been very interested in trying to identify and characterize what these interacting and associated uh, proteins are. And then ultimately, we're, we're really interested in trying to identify the commonalities and the differences between endocrine-sensitive and endocrine-resistant contexts, really with the goal of trying to identify the core components or nodes in this complex that might be therapeutic drug targets. So a number of years ago now, we went about mapping estrogen receptor binding sites in a breast cancer cell line. Now, up, up until that point, we, if this is the gene here that I'm highlighting here, we and other labs in the field had been studying the promoter of one or two target genes, and we had assumed that that was a region that estrogen receptor made contact with and regulated the gene via. And we went about mapping estrogen receptor using a method called chromatin IP. And essentially, it uses an antibody to pull out the estrogen receptor and then a discovery tool to identify all the DNA that is stuck to the estrogen receptor. And this allows us to take an unbiased um, uh, view of, uh, and, and ask the question, where in the genome does estrogen receptor make contact? And what we found was that estrogen receptor actually quite rarely interacts with promoter regions. And in fact, it tends to bind to the genome quite far from any coding genes. Now, we know this is the case um, for many nuclear receptors now, but at the time, this was quite a surprise to us. And we took the many, many thousands of estrogen receptor contact points um, that were, in most cases, in the middle of nowhere in the genome. And we put them together, and we, we looked for patterns. And what we were looking for were DNA sequences that were overrepresented that might give us some insight to why estrogen receptor interacted with this specific region in the genome as opposed to the other, the other regions it could possibly interact with. And when we were looking for DNA motifs, we found this sequence. Uh, 
And this sequence, when we put it through the database, is the perfect consensus sequence for a family of transcription factors called forked proteins. So we got very interested in forked proteins overnight, and it took us a couple of years to figure out what forked protein was uh, involved, and it turned out it's a forked protein called FOXA1. And we now know that FOXA1 is what's called a pioneer factor. Now, as the name suggests, it can get to the DNA before other proteins. So if you envisage DNA wrapped around nucleosomes, and we know the nucleosomes are well positioned, there is a, a piece of DNA in the middle called a linker histone. And normally what happens is linker proteins will interact with this piece of DNA in between the nucleosomes and compact it. Now what FOXA1 does, it can mimic these linker histones, but it has higher affinity for the chromatin, so it keeps it open. So essentially, FOXA1 functions as a, a chromatin opening mechanism and then as an adapter protein. So really, this, this protein here is the, is the protein that determines where estrogen receptor interacts with the genome and when. And we know that FOXA1 is critical for estrogen receptor activity, not just in our cell line models, but, but because we know that if we look in gene signatures of ER positive breast cancer patients, there are always three genes that come up as signature genes of an ER positive uh, tumor. And one is estrogen receptor, and the other one is FOXA1. And the third one is a protein called GATA3, which I'm not going to talk about today. So over a number of years, my lab has been teasing apart the role of this pioneer factor FOXA1, and we've been taking it out of our cell line models and assessing what impact the, the silencing or inhibition of FOXA1 has on estrogen receptor activity. And it looks pretty binary. If FOXA1 is there, estrogen receptor can interact with the DNA and it has transcriptional activity. If we get rid of FOXA1, the estrogen receptor can't interact with the chromatin. Now, it just floats around in the nucleus. We still think it can interact with the cofactors, but it can't make contact with the chromatin. And as you would expect, if estrogen receptor can't make contact with the DNA, it lacks transcriptional activity, and we don't see gene expression events, and, and cells no longer grow. So FOXA1 looks like it is a critical factor for estrogen receptor function. And then a number of years ago now, I had a very talented PhD student called Karen Ross Innes who wanted to set up these genomic mapping techniques called CHIP-seq. She wanted to do it in pieces of breast cancer. Now, up until that point, all the labs in the world studying this had been looking in cancer cell lines growing on plastic. And I, she wanted to give it a shot in pieces of tumor. I, I wasn't sure whether it was going to work or not, but she has absolutely golden hands and she managed to get it working. And um, some of the data we got from the, the tumors were better than what we were seeing from our cell line models, which was very encouraging, and we were quite excited about that. And I remember when she got the first batch of data, and I remember I was um, a little nervous because I'd built my career in studying estrogen receptor and cancer cell lines growing on plastic. We had data from real pieces of tumor straight from surgery, which we'd processed and mapped estrogen receptor binding sites using ChIP-seq. I have to say, I was a little worried. I thought, what if the models and the conclusions, or the conclusions and the paradigms we were drawing from our cancer cell line models didn't hold true in primary tumors? And it turned out the cell line models were perfect, because the data we got from our primary tumors told us exactly the same thing. We found these long distance regulatory enhancers, and we found four uh, head motifs and a role for FOXA1. Now, what Karen could do for the first time was compare the estrogen receptor genomic binding profile in tumors from women that had a different outcome. So she mapped estrogen receptor binding in women uh, that had breast cancer that, were, that was uh, positive by immunohistochemistry for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. We know these women are alive. And she mapped estrogen receptor binding sites in tumors from women um, that relapsed and died of breast cancer. And these, these women had all the hallmarks of a poor outcome breast cancer because they lacked the progesterone receptor. What we found was that estrogen receptor still sits on the genome in both contexts, but it moves around the genome. So estrogen receptor will sit at one set of regulatory elements or enhancers in this context and regulate one set of genes, and then it moves around the genome and interacts with a different set of regulatory elements in this context and regulates different genes. And the, the net consequence of this, this remobilization or this reprogramming of estrogen receptor is quite, quite profound because these women here will respond to endocrine agents and these women will not. So we were very interested in trying to identify what allowed estrogen receptor to hop around the genome. We had a, a couple of working hypotheses. One was potential post-translational modifi modifications. The other one was potentially just changes in chromatin structure. 
And then a third working hypothesis was that maybe there were changes in associated proteins that allowed estrogen receptor to move around the genome. And so we pursued this last one, um, mostly because we were uh, interested in, in developing methods to address this and applying these methods to a number of questions in the lab. So a PhD student in my lab called Hisham Muhammad developed a method called RIME, which stands for Rapid IP Mass Spec of Endogenous Proteins. And essentially, it's a modified chromatin IP. So you use an antibody and you pull out your protein of interest. But instead of looking at the DNA, which is what we had been doing for the previous five or six years, we were looking for protein interactions using mass spec. And there are many, many methods out there for doing this. He added a couple of twicks, tricks and tweaks that made this very sensitive, and we could do it from endogenous protein, which was, um, which was really largely uh, ignored and, and not possible up until this point. And so when Hisham pulled out estrogen receptor, we found the usual suspects. We found FOXA1, we found GATA3, we found the usual cofactors, P300, CBP. What we found when we co-treated our cells with both estrogen and progesterone was we found that these two nuclear receptors, so estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor made, made physical contact. So in the presence of both of these hormones, the progesterone receptor gets recruited to the estrogen receptor complex, and there was actual physical interactions between these two, uh, I guess, sister pathways or sister proteins. And, and we, we, we were very interested by this because, of course, up until this point, the progesterone receptor had been thought of as just a downstream target gene of estrogen receptor. It was a biomarker of estrogen receptor transcriptional activity. As what this suggested to us was that maybe the progesterone receptor might actually have a functional role with estrogen receptor because of this, this uh, physical interaction. So we repeated the experiment, but instead of looking at proteins, we went back and we performed a chip sequencing experiment, which allowed us to assess the, all the genomic contact points of estrogen receptor. And the data shown here, and I'll walk you through this because there's quite a lot going on here. So the experiment was cells growing in the presence of estrogen. So well, everything was in the presence of estrogen. And then we treated our cells for very short time periods with either progesterone or a synthetic progestin called R5020. And then we performed estrogen receptor genomic mapping experiments. And what we found was that after this very short treatment with progesterone, estrogen receptor moves around the genome. And here's an example of a peak here on the left-hand side. So this is estrogen receptor binding in the presence of estrogen. There's nothing going on at this particular genomic locus. And when we add either progesterone or the synthetic progestin, we see really nice recruitment of estrogen receptor to these two locations. And when we perform the same experiment, but we look where progesterone receptor binds, it goes to the exact same locations, and we also see the recruitment of this, this protein called P300, which is a coactivator. And all of these three proteins indicate to us that this new binding site that is induced by progesterone receptor is transcriptionally active. It's going to transcribe a gene. It may be this gene here. It may be a gene a million base pairs away. We're still trying to figure that out. And in this particular experiment, we found about 14,000 of these progesterone-induced estrogen receptor binding sites. We reproducibly see the same sites, experiment after experiment. Now, when we started presenting this data, we, we hit a bit of a wall, because it turns out there is a lot of literature in the progesterone field, and there are uh, paradigms that are set in concrete. And um, our, our, I guess our data on what we were suggesting really flew in the face of a lot of the literature that was out there. And a large part of the, the, the fields that are interested in studying progesterone in cancer um, and progesterone receptor in cancer suggest that progesterone is a bad thing. And that is really based on two key observations. And I'm going to walk you through this because this is really, really important. So a lot of the work has come from normal, healthy, non-cancerous tissue. Now, we know in, almost entirely in, in mice studies, but more recently, Catherine Briskin has shown the same thing in uh, human cells. We know that progesterone receptor will cause cell proliferation in a very small percentage of cells, but the progesterone uh, addition to, to mice or injection of progesterone will cause a small percentage of mammary cells to proliferate. And the mechanism of this is pretty well, pretty well defined. It's known that progesterone receptor will induce this gene called rank ligand, and then rank ligand through paracrine signaling will regulate ex uh, expression of various genes that culminate in cell proliferation. Now, like I said, this has mostly been studied in mice. And then, of course, there's the data from the Women's Health Initiative study, so the hormone, repla uh, sorry, the hormone replacement therapy study, which would suggest that the, the synthetic progestin in, in, in um, HRT is deleterious. Now, we know the data is pretty solid. For every 10,000 women years of HRT use, you get an extra eight cases of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Now, unusually, they, they tend to be lobular cancer, so there's something going on there, and we haven't quite figured that out. 
Now, MPA is a progestin, of course, but it, it hits more than just a progesterone receptor. It also hits glucocorticoid receptor and androgen receptor. But this piece of data strengthened the argument that giving women a progestin is bad because you're going to create cancer. Now, I would actually argue that it's very much context dependent. Now, it turns out, and this is data that's just coming out over the last 12 months or so, that the findings that have been observed in, in normal mouse mammary glands do not hold true in cancer. So if you look at rank ligand, which is meant to be this pro-proliferative target, it turns out that it, its expression level is much, much lower in cancer than it is in adjacent normal. And rank ligand expressions do not correlate with outcome. And we can use this biomarker called key 67 which is a, um, a marker of proliferation. And we can find, if anything, we find an inverse correlation between rank ligand and key 67 which would suggest that what's been um, concluded from the, the normal, healthy murine context doesn't necessarily hold true in cancer. And a paradox, well, I consider it a paradox anyway, is that the same agent that is used in HRT and is considered deleterious actually is an effective treatment in women that have this disease. So if women have ER positive disease, you, and they are given MPA or a structurally similar compound called megastrol acetate, you will see clinical response rates of about 35 or 40%. And this is in women that have relapsed on aromatase inhibitors and, um, and also in, in primary, tumor, primary tumors when compared to tamoxifen or the early uh, aromatase inhibitors. And we also know that progesterone itself actually decreases your risk of breast cancer. And there are a number of studies that suggest this, and I'm happy to talk about this later if people are interested. But for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the extra extrapolations from normal tissue to cancer isn't really appropriate. And I think what's going on is it's just there's molecular rewiring. So the pathways that a progesterone receptor uses in normal mammary gland uh, are corrupted um, or altered such that the, the pathways that are characterized in normal mammary gland biology do not necessarily uh, do the same thing in cancer. Now we have pursued this as, as much as we can. Now we have done um, uh, in vivo um, experiments of all sorts. I'm going to show you a couple of a couple of the experiments that we've generated over the last year or so. Um, and this is essentially to assess whether progesterone is a good thing or a bad thing. Now we have grown uh, cancer cell line tumors, uh, xenograft uh, tumors in mice, and these are, this is the, the tumor growth rate in the presence of estrogen. If we co-treat with progesterone, we see this very, very predictable and reproducible um, diminution. It's not a complete inhibition, but it's about a 50% reduction, and we see this time and time again. We see the same reprogramming that we saw from our cell line models. And we've taken this one step further, and we've set up what are called explant experiments. So these are prime pieces of primary tumor that have come straight from surgery that we can chop into little pieces, and we can randomize them and essentially do a hormonal comparison in, in the lab. Now, these pieces of tumor will stay alive for about a week. Um, so that's about as, as much as we can get out of them. But we can deprive them of hormones and then treat them with estrogen or estrogen plus progesterone and then measure the proliferative response. These haven't gone through a mouse. These have come straight from surgery and, and it's the same tumor that we're comparing different hormonal um, conditions um, with. And I'm actually going to show you the next slide because this is some triple immunofluorescence data. Now, we're looking at estrogen receptor expression, progesterone receptor expression, and key 67 expression. So as I already mentioned, key 67 is a hallmark of proliferation. So if you have a blue cell, it's proliferating. And we can see in, and these, remember these are pieces of, of uh, clinical samples that we've been growing for about a week. So if we, we treat these bits of tumor for, with estrogen for about a week, we see an increase in proliferation. And if we co-treat with progesterone, this gets blocked down to baseline levels. So progesterone is anti-proliferative in vitro, in vivo, and ex, ex vivo. So we've taken a small number of tumors from the estrogen-treated explants. And we've taken a small number of tumors from the, the um, explant experiment that was treated with both estrogen and progesterone, and we've performed our, our genomic mapping experiments, our ER, ChIP-seq experiments. And we see the same thing that we saw in the xenografts and in cell lines. We see this, this uh, quite large global reprogramming of estrogen receptor binding sites in the presence of progesterone. And these sites, these estrogen receptor contact sites that are induced by progesterone are not random. They tend to go to sites that we would have predicted based on the data that we, we had mapped from our primary tumors that I mentioned right at the beginning. So these binding sites were the same sites that we saw in our good outcome uh, tumors from Karen Ross Innes' work several years ago. And I think what we're doing is, in many ways, I think we're recapitulating premenopausal conditions because we're adding back progesterone to tumors from women that are postmenopausal.
And so we've done the, the experiment that seemed quite obvious to us, and that was to combine the uh, progesterone receptor ligand with an estrogen receptor antagonist. And so far we've done the xenograft models. We're doing this on the explants um, as we speak. Now, what we know is that we get uh, quite nice tumor formation in the presence of estrogen. So all of these experiments have been done in the presence of estrogen. And if we treat with progesterone, we see this, this uh, moderate decrease in proliferation. If we treat with the estrogen receptor antagonist tamoxifen, we see a decrease. And if we treat with both agents, we see the greatest inhibition. Now, we've seen this in multiple experiments and across multiple different models. And so based on this data, we're initiating a, a clinical trial, a window trial, that's going to compare exactly this. It's going to compare uh, an estrogen receptor antagonist with a progesterone receptor agonist. Now, the reason why we're quite excited about this is these progestins that we're talking about are pretty well tolerated, they're safe, they've been around a long, long time, and they are cheap. What well, they have not been used for is they've not been used in primary tumor in primary tumor context in combination with the standard of care. So we've raised the funds for this clinical trial, and hopefully we'll have data um, within 12 months. So this is the way that we visualize it. So we know in the presence of estrogen, estrogen receptor is on the DNA and it's doing its job. It's switching on a number of genes. We are pretty happy with what the target genes are of the estrogen receptor complex. They are cell cycle genes like CMYK and cyclin D1. What we now know is that if we co-treat with both estrogen and progesterone, progesterone receptor functions almost like a, a molecular sink, if you will. It sequesters the estrogen receptor away from these sites and to different sites. And the genes that become regulated are more linked with apoptosis and differentiation. So in many ways, the progesterone receptor reprograms estrogen receptor away from sites that will cause cell division to, to, to genes that um, are less likely to contribute to, to cell proliferation. Now we know that this mechanism, this molecular handbrake, if you will, can get switched off via a number of different mechanisms. Now one, of course, is the loss of the ligand. So we know in postmenopausal women that the, the levels of progesterone decrease substantially, and the, importantly, the ratio between estrogen and receptor changes quite dramatically. So in postmenopausal women, you lose the ligand. So essentially, this, this repressive mechanism is no longer present. And we also know that one of the most common, commonly uh, um, lost or deleted genes in breast cancer, it turns out, is progesterone receptor. So about a fifth of all ER-positive breast cancers will delete a copy of progesterone receptor. So it will remove or delete the, the genomic locus that encompasses the progesterone receptor gene. And we suspect this is, this is another mechanism to lose this repressive um, uh, handbrake, if you will. Now, in the last couple of minutes, sorry, I'm only giving you a couple of minutes, um, I want to switch gears, and I want to tell you about something that we're doing at the moment. This is a work in progress, but it's something that we're very, very excited about. Now, as I mentioned, we, we have um, been focused on this protein called FOXA1 for a number of years now. It looks like it's a critical pioneer factor of the estrogen receptor complex. We know it's expressed in metastases. We've um, done some immunohistochemistry and shown that it is expressed in almost all of the metastatic samples that we've looked at. And we know that it actually it, it, it is a vulnerability in this complex because we know now that drugs that target the estrogen receptor for many women will fail. And that the escape mechanisms are, are, are quite diverse. We know that estrogen receptor can get phosphorylated. So there are growth factors that can induce resistance. We now know that estrogen receptor will get mutated. And we know that there are changes in cofactors that can contribute to endocrine resistance. But what we're starting to appreciate in, is that in all contexts, regardless of how a tumor has escaped estrogen receptor antagonists, that tumor is still dependent on FOXA1. So the pioneer factor is still there and it's still needed. So we ask the question of whether FOXA1 can be drugged or not. And I think it really depends who you speak to. Now these are traditionally considered undruggable targets. Transcription factors are uh, yeah, considered undruggable by the pharmaceutical industry. And my response when I hear this, and I've heard this a lot, is, well, what about estrogen receptor? It's a transcription factor, and you can drug that perfectly well. And androgen receptor and glucocorticoid receptor and all of the receptors that people in this room study. Um, now, I suspect the nuclear receptors are um, an exception because they have ligand binding domains. But FOXA1, the biology around FOXA1 was, was interesting, and we thought it was worth, uh, worth pursuing. Now, there is data coming out from a number of labs that suggests that in prostate cancer, even in models of castrate-resistant prostate cancer, where androgen receptor targeting agents fail, FOXA1 is still required. So a FOXA1 inhibitor might have utility both in breast and prostate. So we developed, developed a, a, uh, an assay that allowed us to screen for compounds that would block FOXA1. We had a series of counter screens. We screened 180,000 compounds, and we got our best hit 
and it is doing what we, are hope, what we had hoped for. So this compound is quite potent. Um, now this is, of course, the starting point. We will have to do some medicinal chemistry on this compound. But the, as a starting point, it's, it's pretty encouraging. This compound inhibits growth of ER-positive cells at about 330 nanomolar. It has no effect in ER-negative cells. We've put this across a panel of different models now. And the compound actually stops FOXA1 from getting to the DNA. So we've shown this through a, a number of different assays now. But the presence of the compound stops the pioneer factor from getting onto the, onto the chromatin. And as we would have expected, if you block FOXA1, you block estrogen receptor as well. This compound works in resistant cells, um, and we've put it across about half a dozen endocrine-resistant models, and in all cases, this compound is stopping growth. We're trying to figure out what the compound is doing. We think it's inhibiting a kinase. Now, I knew nothing about signaling pathways and nothing about kinases, and I would have been happy living the rest of my life not knowing anything about kinases, but it turns out that this compound is hitting um, a kinase, so we've had to learn about kinases and, and uh, signaling pathways. And we've done a screen, and we've narrowed it down to about 30 kinases. And then in parallel, what we did was we did a, an siRNA library screen to find kinases that regulated FOXA1. Now, we knew nothing about the enzymes that regulated FOXA1, but like I said, we got quite interested in kinases. So we did this, this, this kinome-wide screen. We found about 40 kinases that looked like they were required for proliferation of cells. And when we do the Venn diagram, so the kinases that are inhibited by the compound and kinases that block growth of our, our ER-positive breast cancer cells, we end up with six. And the six we get are not what we would have expected. Now, I had assumed we would get things like PI3 kinase and AKT, and it turns out the six kinases we got, um, we know very little about. There's almost nothing in the literature, which is exciting, but at the same time, it means that we, we have to build toolboxes to be able to study these kinases. So we've assessed these kinases in a battery of experiments. They all inhibit growth, as I said. They all inhibit uh, growth of resistant cells. They all inhibit estrogen receptor and FOXA1 from getting onto the DNA, and I'm going to show you just one piece of data to, to support this. So this is a Western block looking at FOXA1 and estrogen receptor levels, but it's on the chromatin. So we've enriched just for the DNA, and then we can Western blot for protein that's only on the chromatin. And what we can see is if we inhibit FOXA1, we get less FOXA1, of course, and we get less estrogen receptor. And we've been working our way through our six kinases, and we have at least two, possibly three, that do the same thing as, as silencing FOXA1 does. So we have two, possibly three kinases that are absolutely critical for FOXA1 stability and its ability to interact with the DNA and then subsequently estrogen receptors um, transcriptional activity. So um, I'm going to conclude there. Um, so I've told you a couple of different stories. One is about this hormonal crosstalk where we have implicated progesterone receptor as a molecular inhibitor of the estrogen receptor path, pathway. We've been very interested in pursuing this, um, and we're pushing this as hard as we can. Um, I think the clinical trial is going to be incredibly informative, and like I said, we've raised funds for that, and we'll start recruiting very soon. And that is to compare uh, an estrogen receptor antagonist, so standard of care, with or without um, uh, progesterone receptor ligand. We've also been very interested in androgen receptor. Now, we know that this nuclear receptor crosstalk is likely to be quite a prominent feature in, in many cell types, particularly the hormone-dependent cancers. We see crosstalk between androgen receptor and estrogen receptor. We're not quite sure how androgen receptor and progesterone receptor fit, but I suspect there's going to be a triumvirate there of these three proteins. We know glucocorticoid rece receptor is expressed, so there's likely to be crosstalk there. In prostate cancer, I notice Yonaki is um, in the building. We have found uh, crosstalk between estrogen receptor beta and androgen receptor. So I think this hormonal crosstalk is, is a really exciting opportunity because the, there, are, there are existing ligands for these, for these um, proteins. And we just need to think about how we can um, use them in, more, in, in an effective way. And of course, we need to understand the biology first. And then I mentioned our FOXA1 inhi inhibitor program. So we're taking two approaches to try and target FOXA1. One is a chemical screen. We've got a compound that we're now doing some medicinal chemistry on. And also we've found some enzymes that regulate Fo FOXA1. And re we're really drilling down on the biology of that. And I guess our, our ultimate goal is to try and drug the pioneer factor, not the nuclear receptor. And time will tell whether this is a successful approach or not. And just as a reminder, so um, I guess one of, the, one of the benefits of winning this award was I had the privilege of writing a review article about um, our area, which has just come out, I think, just this week um, in, in European Journal of Endocrinology. So if you're interested, I urge you to have a look.
And finally, I want to thank the people in the lab that did the work, particularly Kelly Holmes, who did the compound screen, and Hisham, who I mentioned, who set up the proteomic screen and um, identified progesterone receptor and did all the biology on progesterone receptor. We've had fantastic collaborations with Wayne Tilly from Australia and a number of our internal and external collaborators who have helped us with computational analyses and with our chemical screen. So thank you for listening. <laughs>